Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really awesome guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow for all of us uh, via the work she's involved in. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Leslie Ogilvie, who is the director of the Global Antimicrobial Resistant R&D Hub Secretariat. Uh, which is a part of a global partnership focused on addressing uh, the challenges and ultimately improving coordination and collaboration uh, across global AMR R&D using a One Health approach. Uh, Dr. Ogilvie joined uh, the global AMR R&D hub back in February 2021, ultimately hoping to combine her scientific insight with the various targeted actions to uh, combat what you know many feel is an extremely silent pandemic uh, that's headed our way, uh, and following you know. 10 years of her experience working in both academia as a researcher and a lecturer in the area of microbial ecogenomics, uh, applying various molecular uh, and bioinformatics tools to tackle these important questions. And she spent a lot of time also focusing on areas like the human gut microbiome, the virome, uh, and their connection to, to health and disease. Uh, Dr. Ogilvie has her uh, bachelor's degree in ecology from the University of Dundee in the UK, a master's in marine resource development Development Protection, uh, Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, her PhD in Environmental Sciences from uh, University of East Anglia, and then did postdoc work at uh, Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics. A uh, very important theme to get into today. We're honored to have her with us. Uh, Dr. Leslie Ogilvie, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk for a little while. Thanks, Sarah. It's really a pleasure to be here today. <laughs> It's uh, it's wonderful to have you uh, in an extremely timely topic. Um, I, I would love to start off uh, as we typically do uh, for the audience to to learn a little bit more about you um, and and how sort of this whole journey got started. If you could take us into a little bit of your background, the development of your intellectual interest in some of these areas like ecology, marine resource development, and so forth, and then you know, I, I was. I was taking a, a brief look at your, your dissertation, which was entitled Effects of Heavy Metals on Estuarine Sediment Communities. And at first I didn't think that was highly connected to AMR, but then when I started getting into some of these themes that you were talking about in terms of uh, pollution-induced community tolerance and how external insults of some type can affect ultimately, you know, uh, physiology and 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 the effects of, of these microbe species in, in positive and negative ways, I thought it kind of perfectly. Take us back to that time, if you would, Leslie, and, and walk us through a bit what you're doing. Thanks. I, I think I, I must have been really interested in uh, why things go wrong. I think I think that's kind of been the common theme throughout throughout my academic career, anyway. So, what happens when you perturb the system? You know, what direction does it take? And it's a bit of a slightly macabre way of looking at uh, life and the environment in general. But um, I think maybe you can tell. I maybe just tell you I'm from Scotland originally, on the the east coast, uh, Dundee, uh, city of Duke Jam and journalism. And I actually started off being really interested in literature. So I think. That must be the Dundee connection with, with journalism. So when as, a when as a teenager, I kind of started studying English and philosophy. So I've kind of got this really sort of weird background, you know, coming from this English and philosophical take on why things go wrong in, in a sense. And then I really got started on a scientific path with ecology and zoology sort of after that. And that was thanks to the Canadian Trust, uh, Trust for the Universities of Scotland. And they gave me a scholarship so I could go on and study science. So thank you very much to, to the, those to that, that institution. 
I think um, I started off my PhD on estra environments. I was really interested in sort of what's happening in the environment. I was part of Greenpeace, you know, I was really just wanting to know what happens when you put a pollutant into an environment. What does it do? What's the biological impact? You know, so then I saw this PhD coming up in University of East Anglia, which was looking at the the effects of uh, metal pollution on estuarine environments. So I went down to Cornwall in the southwest of England and spent a lot of time in waders, you know, digging for sediments and profiling the communities within these sediments. So these were microbial communities, bacterial communities and nematode communities. And nematodes are these really small transparent worms which you can find everywhere and they're quite a nice, you know, from I don't know, from sediments to oceans to deserts, you know, you find them everywhere like bacteria. So we thought we would look at these different types of indicator uh, communities and whether or not we can actually develop a, a sensitive ecotoxicological eco tool for, you know, being able to monitor the impacts of, of sediments. And the, the foul estuary in Cornwall's got this sort of, you know, 100 years history of mining, more than 150 years of, of mining. And it's kind of got uh, a gradient of two um, magnitudes of order in terms of the, the levels of metals that you're seeing in the different parts of parts of estuary. So this is a great, you know, great model system to actually test this type of type of uh, eco toxicological tool. And I mean, one of the main problems in uh, pollution studies is really that you want to develop a tool that it can distinguish between the effects of natural variation from changes caused by our activities. So, you know, we decided, my supervisor at the time, uh, Alistair Grant at the University of East Anglia and Norwich, wanted to use the concept of pollution induced community tolerance or PICT for short. So, uh, that's an indicator of metal pollution on the estuarine ecosystem. Mm -hmm. the, princ the principle is, is that the organisms living in these pollutant exposed areas for a long time will actually become tolerant to the pollutant. And that's usually through uh, evolution of, you know, enhanced tolerance in, in, these species, in the species within the communities and the exclusion of sensitive species due to this long-term exposure to that pollutant. Um, the rationale is that, you know, you can get changes in community structure, but that might be to, to do with anything, you know, it could be to do with climate or, you know, temperature or anything, but tolerance to specific pollutants at community community level can actually only be elicited by the specific pollutant or a related substance or something that, that you know blocks or increases the, the bioavailability of this particular pollutant. So the observation of tolerance at the community level, you know, with all these different factors coming together, provides evidence that a chemical has actually uh, altered a community on a biological level. And, and basically all my PhD really did, it, it's nothing groundbreaking, it just said this, this tool works, it's sensitive, it's reliable, and we've tested it in a really um, sensitive and in a robust manner uh, within this model system. And I, I must admit, I never really followed up uh, with this, but it just in terms of, the, of pollution induced community tolerance, I didn't follow up, you know, when I went into my postdoctoral studies, but it just gave me a, you know, a sense of this idea, again, getting back to that concept of what happens when you perturb the system, whether that's an environment or a human being, you know, what's, what's the outcome and how can we stop that, that happening? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, that that's, those themes then follow you, um, you know, after your dissertation, and you know, you um, and, and again for everybody uh, watching and listening to this show, I, I suggest you uh, take a look at Dr. Ogilvie's uh, extensive publication uh, record that's out there. But Leslie, you you start publishing on topics like metagenomics, like microbial ecology. Uh, you introduce us, um, you know, a couple of years down the line to this this principle of of a resistome, uh, not that just there's interesting genes out there in these bulk systems, but that there are a lot of genes out there that encode for these antibiotic resistance, which we'll be getting into. And then you publish a lot on, you know, what I'll just call the um, the interesting types of warfare that goes on between um, uh, these different microbes with uh, different toxins and antitoxin systems. Uh, you publish on bacteriophage, another important player in that uh, microbial ecology warfare, uh, not just in, in the environment, but in us. Um, 
take us through a little bit of that. Introduce us to to the theme of the resistome and, and a little bit of what uh, you took away from those years, because I think this is all very, uh, very relevant to where we're going next. Yeah, I, I, I must say I didn't take a straight path. You know, I must be hands up that I didn't do that. But yeah, during my PhD, I met um, the wonderful Professor Andrew Johnson. He's also a fellow Scot, and he was actually focusing on how to identify new functions within different bacterial strains, so new bacterial strains which he'd isolated from sediment, so things like the estuarine, estuarine environments that I've been working in. And by the way, he was actually the, the person that discovered the mechanism by which uh, bacteria convert DMSP, which is, um, yeah, I won't say it out loud, into DMS, dimethyl sulfoxide, and that's the molecule that gives the, the ocean that, that that distinctive smell of the sea. So he's the discoverer of the, the smell or the mechanism of the smell, of the smell of the sea. And he asked me to work with him and um, Penny Hirsch at Rothamsted Research. And this is home to one of the, the oldest ongoing agricultural field experiments in the world. And um, this has been established since the, 19, uh, the 1840s. So the project that he asked me to work on was to mine soil bacteria for new functions you know from these long-term field experiments we were taking samples from broadbok uh, broadbok winter wheat experiment which is one of the called the classical experiments and this was established in 1840 and the, what they do is then um, put parts of it with different different fertilizers and then change that regime so you've got a, a constant input of, of different regimes over time and you take samples and you're able to see whether or not that's had an impact in any way in terms of the, the output and the, you know, the harvest and, and also the, the microbial communities which were in the soil. And at that time, people were still using a lot of culture-based approaches to this and we wanted to be able to mine these soil bacteria in a different way. And we used a method called functional metagenomics for this. And that allowed you to really explore the functional potential of the genetic material within an environmental sample. So on a, on a collective basis, so we would take this soil sample, extract high molecular weight DNA from the soil sample, put it into a vector that would allow you to express that combined genetic potential. Uh, of the, the bacterial bacteria within that, that soil sample. And you put it into a lab strain of E. coli, and then this would allow you to, these genes to be expressed, and then you'd be able to screen for different functions. So whether or not that was antibiotic resistance or other types of functions, we were actually looking for genes involved in the nitrogen cycle, which we didn't find any new pathways or anything, or we, or we didn't actually find any new antibiotic resistance genes or ones that we could have verified. We, we did find some functionality, but ones that we couldn't verify in, in the end. So uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, just exploration of what was there. You know, this was a time to use these new techniques, apply them to uh, the soil microbiome in the end. And that's what we were, that's what we were trying to do and seeing whether or not we can find new functions associated with these soil bacteria. And just to put this in context, you know, this is in 2004, so it's, uh, you know, almost two dec dec decades ago now. And that was just shortly after the first draft of the, the human genome was published. Uh, and that was after 10 years and $3 billion. So technology wasn't as well developed as, as we have now, of course, you know, so this is 20 years ago, so it's a long time. So we had a lot of, you know, manual work to actually explore these uh, soil microbiome samples. Um, after this, I got really, really interested in the technique in the, in the functional metagenomics technique because it was a way of exploring what we didn't, the unknown in the end. And I think that's been another common theme that's kind of going, going through the work that I've, I've been doing, you know, perturbing a system, finding out what, what's the dark matter that's there, you know, if you're yep. thinking about a microbiome, what's there and how can we use the tools that we have to investigate who's there and what they're, what they're doing. And so that's what we were trying to do at the University of Brighton. That's when I started my first postdoc yep. um, in 2010, I think that was. Um, and I was working with Dr. Brian Jones. He's now at the University of Bath. And I think this is really where my interest in antimicrobial resistance actually got started, you know, because we started to work on a number of different EMR related projects, some more than others, you know, and uh, we're using a combination of bioinformatic and experimental techniques to explore, you know, basically the human gut microbiome in most cases in, in health and disease. So 
Brian and I got really interested in using um, bioinformatic techniques and we saw that there was a growing database of human gut microbial metagenomes and this is the, the combined genetic material from uh, stool samples so yep. people would be taking DNA from these stool samples, sequencing it and depositing it in uh, gen bank, you know, data banks which other scientists could look at and explore and these were coming much you know much more available there was um, the meta hit uh, meta genome series that was a long time ago now 2010 um, hundreds of these meta genomes available and we wanted to know more about what was going on in these data sets could we actually find out more than that was published at the time could we look at them in a different way using different bio bioinformatic techniques and um, we came up with a way of using a genome signature method so this is uh, based on the frequency of different tetranucleotides so this is a sequence of four base pairs and we look at the pattern of those four, four base pairs uh, throughout the genome and of, of or throughout the sequences that we've that we gather, we've gathered in these, these data sets and this is a different approach than, than homology where you actually just look at the similarities between sequences and say, okay, that's quite similar, that sequence similar to that one, so they must be related in some way. So we were looking at it on a more genome level rather than just on fragments of, of sequence homology on the gene level. And what this, what this approach allowed us to do was really detect a large number of bacteriophage sequences. Okay. And, these are, and these are viruses which infect bacteria, as, as you know. And these have never, you know, we, this is all public data, and this, these were all uh, bacteriophage sequences within these data sets that nobody had ever looked at. So we're kind of being able to shine a bit of a light on these unknown sequences. Nobody had ever described them before. We didn't know that there were so many bacteriophage within the human gut uh, microbiome in general. There was some one or two studies that had started to say, okay, there is a human gut virome as well, and it actually might be much more. Um, in volume, in terms of the, the sequence uh, sequences that you can derive from these samples. But what we really wanted to show was that these bacteriophage encode functions that are uh, relevant to human health, uh, yep. and that was including antibiotic resistance genes. Uh, and what was really important for us is to show that they, you know, we were finding these phage in three quarters of of uh, the data sets that we looked at, we would find the sequences you know, by hom homology and through our genome signature approach, we'd find we'd be able to locate them in three quarters of the data sets that we looked at. You know, so this is, they're broadly, broadly distributed within the population and these bacteriophage were carrying antibiotic resistance genes. And this was something that hadn't been described uh, very much at the time. And uh, one of them, one of the, Phage encoded resistance determinants we found were capable of conferring resistance to beta lactam and antibiotic somacillinum. Mm -hmm. And at that time, um, this antibiotic was was not widely used in many European countries or in the US, but had been okay. identified as a potentially useful in the treatment of multi drug resistant infections, and especially caused by brown negative species. So, for us to be able to identify viable mycillin resistance genes circulate, circulating among phage, which are widespread within the human gut microbiome, was really significant and really worrying because we thought that phage didn't really have much to do with the transfer of antibiotic resistance genes at this, at this time. And uh, what we were able to do is show that they were functional. It wasn't just, you know, looking at the sequence and saying, oh, we predict that they're functional. We actually took those genes and popped them in E. coli and uh, popped them on an agar plate and saw that they were, they were actually conferring resistance to E. coli when we transferred those genes. So we have the, the potential to spread by horizontal genes, gene transfer. I think there's been a lot of work done sort of in follow-up to that that's shown that maybe maybe the ability to phage to um, uh, and to contribute to the, the the transfer of antibiotic resistance is maybe not as widespread as, as we thought at the time but yeah further work still to be done on that um, it's still it's still not conclusive hmm. that's so, uh, it, please no no please please go ahead <laughs> no it, it's just like it, it's uh, it's that's a really amazing finding in its own right because we 
you know, we hear so much about bacteriophages being one of these areas that, uh, all right, we know about this for a long time, that these viruses may be useful for us. And there's certain countries where they, yeah, I know it goes back to the days of penicillin that it was thought of, okay, that these could be a useful tool, but now you're finding out at the same time that uh, they're also, they're also being bad <laughs> and, and they're doing na naughty things as well. That's not good, but please continue. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's always a, a good and a bad side to everything, isn't there? So, yeah. so I, th I think at that time, you know, myself and Brian, we had this really productive um, time uh, at the University of Brighton, and we got interested in lots of different subjects and established many different collaborations, which allowed us to use this functional metagenomic pro approach to, to sort of explore different aspects of the human gut microbiome, so whether that was a virome or the infant gut was a stone. And the infant gut resistome work, so that's the collection of antibiotic resistance genes within the gut. Okay. And this was done with collaborators at the University College Cork and TGASC in, in Ireland. Uh, so that's like a, a research initiative that actually focuses on food, food re research. And mm. uh, the, um, we were working with Fiona Fui uh, at uh, TGASC uh, in Ireland for this. And so the outcome of this work is that we use this functional metagenomic approach, looked for antibiotic regimes, looked at how, um, you know, we looked at how um, prevalent they were in these, in these stool samples that were collected from uh, uh, infant, from infants, I think they were from one week old to um, three months old, and we were able to see that um, the infant gut resistance was established early in life, perhaps even at birth. You know, this is this is a pre-exposure to, to antibiotics. This is, you know, through the, the maternal influence uh, right. of this. So detecting antibiotic resistance genes in one week old infants was a, a bit of a surprise for, for us as well. Um, we, yeah, it was, it was shock, you know, we were always getting shocked by the sort of uh, the things that we were finding out using using this approach. We also use the functional metagenomic approach uh, with colleagues at Utrecht University, and they right. wanted to, to look at the impact of selective digestive decontamination. So that's like a pro prophylactic use of antibiotics and, and an antifungal agent. And they use this, or they used to use this in the Netherlands um, when a patient came into the ICU, and just to make sure that they didn't uh, get an infection. So if somebody in a critical condition, you give them this given this mass of antibiotics and antifungals uh, straight away uh, before they stabilize them. And what we, we found over, over two years that it, the, the application of this approach increased the antibiotic genes circulating within the human gut, micro, gut microbiome. And, and it caused, a, um, in a sense, a dysbiosis of the microbiome because nothing went back to normal again, even after two years. You know, we didn't see a, a reduction in, in these antibiotic resistance genes. It'd be nice to do longer term studies and have a baseline, you know, to be able to say this is what the, the human gut microbiome looked at when this person entered the ICU, uh, before they entered the ICU, and this is what happened to their, human, their, their gut microbiome over the next two or three years. So at the time, it was just you know, a snapshot of what was there, but again, increases in antibiotic resistance genes were, were significant and they were circulating within the human gut microbiome. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, so after that, I think we went into the phage therapy um, route. You know, we were interested sure. in Brian had already been working with Proteus mirabilis. Yep. And this is a pathogen which causes uh, incrustation of um, catheters. So many, many um, long term hospitalized patients or people in nursing homes, they have a catheter inserted. And these protea species, they're, they cause these biofilms and they've got urease in them. And it just blocks the, the catheter. And sometimes even when you, you treat them with antibiotics, it, it, they don't go away. You know, you can't get rid of these infections. It seems to just right. become, become chronic. So we were trying to look for alternatives to this. And of course, we were getting interested in phage from our, from our previous work, you know, looking at the human gut virome and thought, well, why, why don't we try phage for Proteus mirabilis 
uh, in infections and see what happens. And we had these this uh, great setup in the lab. It was like these glass bottles, which were really meant to represent a bladder, and we filled them up with you know um, artificial urine, added some Proteus in there, and then some phage, and just let you know let's see what happens. Ran, ran the you know ran the, the sort of artificial urine through these these bladders into the, the catheters and, and what we found that they, they had a, a real significant impact on reducing the, the buildup of Proteus mirabilis and the, the blockage of the, the catheters and what we were able to do then is characterise these genomically and the cocktails that we used as well, it wasn't just one phage, it was like a, a mixture of different phage that we were using to clear the blockage in the, in the catheter. And so what was important if you're thinking about therapeutic phages really to, to make sure that they don't have anything nasty on them. You know, are they carrying these right, right. antibiotic resistance genes? Ah, do they have vir virulence traits? You know, if you're going to use them as a therapeutic, you got to make sure you really understand, you know, what genes are, are there. And that's what kind of what we got interested in doing was really characterizing these phage in depth, you know, it's a bit of a first step, you know, before you sort of go any anywhere near an animal model or a human model, you want to make sure that the phage that you're looking at are suitable for treatment purposes. So yeah, um, next was um, Max Planck, I guess, you know, um, moving to Berlin. Um, I started to get I started to get interested in the, the connection between the, the gut microbiome and the human host, you know, and it always annoyed me that we were, we were looking at things in, in isolation and I really wanted to sort of bring those two aspects together, you know, we're all part of the same system and if we only understand one part of the system then we're not really understanding the whole in a sense. So, and uh, I met Hans Lerach and moved to Berlin, he was the director of the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics at the time and he was really instrumental and you know making me think about the bigger picture you know why are we doing this are we doing this research just for the next paper or do we really want to help people you know what's the you know what's the reason what's the rationale why why are you actually in in science and i think if you know i think it was meeting him and speaking to him and you know getting insight into all the things he was doing in terms of, you know, he's using digital twin models to predict the outcomes of cancer treatment. He was using the molecular data from the tumor and the host and sort of comparing those and saying, okay, this tumor has this, this variant on it and we're going to use our, our mechanistic model to be able to predict predict the, the outcome of, a, of treatment from, you know, from, this, from this data. And then also projects where he was using multi-omics for disease prevention, sort of, you know, sequencing the genome. Do you have any variants in it? Can we use that to prevent, actually prevent disease? So it just sort of opened up this, this world of, you know, why, why are we actually doing this? You know, are we doing it for the paper? Or are we doing it for, you know, you know moving knowledge on and uh, making sure that we can actually have a, a new policy or a new regulation that makes sure that people can uh, actually access the, the scientific advances that have been generated over over the years. And I think that was probably sort of the, the, the biggest takeaway that I had working with Hans, you know, working on all these different projects with him, um, just opened that door to the importance mm -hmm. of making sure scientific advances are actually translated into tools that can actually help people. And I think that's kind of what brought me to the hub in a sense, yep. you know, uh, that translation of science in, into policy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. No, no, that, that, that was awesome. I really appreciate it. And again, you know, I, I was following those papers as you were talking about them and, you know, the biofilms and, and Proteus, and then you got some systems biology and virtual drug discovery work. You know, it's it's a, I know you were joking before the show that it was all, but it's not really over the place because it all comes together, as you're just pointing out, uh, with what you're doing now, because... Uh, uh, one, we have a problem coming our way in AMR, and I think a lot of people would call it the silent pandemic, but we don't want to be silent about this one because it's it's headed our way. A lot of the people that we've had on the show have said, yeah, this is a this is a problem, uh, whether it's the WHO or the United Nations or the, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. Um, take some time now, if you would, because clearly um, the 
global MRND hub, you are, you know, the leader of the the, the secretariat and 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 sort of coordinating uh, a lot of what's going on per the R and D program. Walk us through, because I know you, you, it was launched back in 2018, a major G20 initiative. Uh, you have countries, philanthropic organizations, NGOs, industry, um, research groups like Carbex, who we profiled on the show a few months ago. Take us through the history of it. Take us through your again your arrival there, your role per uh, the the R and D uh, hub, uh, and a little bit of sort of the. I mean, you got a lot of strategies there, but a little bit of sort of the core of what what's been happening in the last couple of years uh, per addressing this major AMR issue. Yeah, so, so so maybe you have to give a bit more context in, in a Please. sense on why why we really needed the hub, I guess, in Please. the first first place. So so we we're basically in the midst of this antibiotic development and uh, access crisis. I'm sure you've I'm sure you've heard that before from WHO yep. and Carbex, you know. Um, is, is, I think we, we repeat this a lot, but I think we need to. I think people really need to know that there's no yes. new class of antibiotic reach clinical practice since 1987. You know, we know that antibacterial development pipeline is insufficient to really counteract the, the emergence and spread of resistance. Uh, 77 antibacterials in clin clinical development at the moment. But if you compare that to oncology, there's 1,300, you know, so yeah. it's it's insufficient, it's lacking. Uh, we, we need more drugs to combat AMR. And, and even if we do have these drugs, people are not actually getting them. The Hub's actually done studies where we've uh, modelled new drugs going into new markets and whether or not they would reach the people that actually need them, and they don't. And we know that for many different sources and without these drugs we're going to lose modern medicine it's clear you know we take it for granted you know if we don't have new antibiotics um, that will counteract infections you know what happens when you come for chemotherapy hip replacement cesarean sections where you know you get these antibiotics just without thinking about them you take it for granted it's part of the infrastructure so you don't actually recognize that they're there and without these new antibiotics we're not going to have modern medicine anymore and that's that's clear yeah. so so yeah there's a there's a, a clear and imminent danger it's not a silent pandemic it's here already you know we're, we're part we're in a we're in a pandemic already uh, you know 1.27 million people dying in 2019 directly due to uh, drug resistant infections up to 4 million associated deaths uh, due to drug resistance it's a, it's a clear pandemic at, at the moment. I think um, just to set the scene a bit more for the hub, you know, back in 2014, the, the UK government commissioned a report on, on AMR, and this was headed by Lord Jim O'Neill, and he's an economist, and they really wanted to see what the scale of the, the rise in drug resistance challenge was and really propose concrete actions to tackle it on a, on a global scale and this was published in 2016 okay. and what this report did was really just provide really amazingly clear recommendations of what could be done you know they're really clear from stronger public awareness of the issue of AMR you know nobody knows what AMR they still they still don't in a sense you know we, we need to strengthen infection protection control we need to develop new products such as antibiotics and we need to make sure there's an environment in the market for um, incentivizing the development of these, these new antibiotics and, and, their, uh, and their alternatives. But we also needed, what they also called for, uh, was a stronger leadership from the UN and the G20 on the subject matter. So that's 2016. And in 2017, Germany held the presidency of the G20 and they um, called for the hub to be set up. So. Uh, a cooperation and collaboration hub that would enhance uh, AMR R&D. So we would have the therapeutics, the diagnostics, the vaccines and the other solutions that we really need to uh, make sure that we can mitigate the impacts of AMR. So we were established in 2018 after that call from the, the G20 and uh, operational by 2019. So we have a board of members, um, 17 mm -hmm. countries, plus the European Commission, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Wellcome Trust. And we also have a number
number of observers. We have WHO on board, FEO, uh, WOA, OECD, and most recently Africa CDC. Uh, as, on, in combination with this, we have a stakeholder group and we have Academ academics, uh, funders, industry and civil society, and also um, the NGOs uh, there. Mm -hmm. and, what, and what they do is they advise us and give us a, a different perspective on the specific topic. So we've got like the, the sort of member state perspective, and then we also got the, the stakeholder perspective across the value chain, you know, from basic research to actually trying to market these, these different, different products. And so this this really broad membership really allows us to you know to provide a, a broad perspective on the problem. You know we you know with our membership we can actually discuss the challenges we have in EMR R and D and uh, help us to align and avoid duplicative efforts. And uh, that goes across the push and the the pool spectrum. So funding yeah. for research projects and the financial and other incentives to help the scientific breakthroughs actually reach the market and whether or not that's that's uh, financial input or whether that's that's uh, help with clinical trials or regulatory input uh, we need all of those coming together to make sure that the basic research actually is translated into something that can reach the market and is, um, is sustainable mm -hmm. and i think one of our key outputs um, has been or is still is the dynamic dashboard yep. and this, this is a online platform which really collates and presents information on public and philanthropic funding for AMR R&D and I want to under underline that this is just public and philanthropic funding because it's not from the private sector as yet We're trying to get information to add there so you have a much more comprehensive picture of what's going in to AMR R&D and this is across the one health spectrum so uh, projects covering human health plant health animal health and environmental Health. We know that uh, we need to, to look at this with a, a One Health perspective. We know that resistance crosses these different sectors, and without you know taking this approach, we're not going to come up with solutions that really work for everybody and stop that resistance uh, yeah, accelerating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what yeah, the um, just uh, and again for. For people that are listening and watching, you can go to uh, the hub to check out uh, the, um, the the dynamic dashboard that Dr. Bogu was talking about and uh, look at sort of, because you, know, you connect the push-pull as you were just talking about across sort of the three segments, but sorry, uh, keep going. <laughs> yeah, no, I, no I, I, will, I will tell you a bit more about the, the dashboard as well, definitely. Um, it's, uh, it's, please do visit it if you get the chance, it'd be great. So yeah, so yeah, we've got the, the board of members, the observers, we've got the stakeholder group and we've got the secretariat and the secretariat, so I'm the director of the secretariat, we're a really small team and we're the ones that kind of put into action the the day-to-day -day activities, you know, that we speak to the board and say, okay, what do you think we should be doing? I think we should be moving this topic forward. We need to provide more information or recommendations on the specific gap in funding, whether or not that's animal health or uh, funding for um, EMR R&D in low and middle income countries. You know, we, we partner with different, different organizations and provide reports and recommendations that allow us to uh, use the data from the dashboard and also the collective intelligence from our board and from the secretariat in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so my role is just coordinating that, that work and also being able to uh, think strategically and how do we actually navigate the, the changing landscape. You know, we've had COVID-19 having an immense impact on global health. And so take, you know, the priorities shift, you know, it could be AMR in 2017, but it was COVID-19 in 2020, 2020. So we need to make sure that we are able to navigate these, these shift in priorities at the, the international level. And that's part of my, my job as well. And, and let's just say a, a couple of words. I mean, you, you mentioned the One Health approach. I think this is extremely important because um, aside from obviously the human component of this, you know, we, you know, we've talked a lot about appropriate antibiotic stewardship in the animal health domain. Um, and, and we forget that 
yes, the worst of the worst of all pandemics that ever hit us, uh, the the Black Plague. Um, you know, I was a gram negative bacteria, one a virus. Uh, say a couple words about your collaboration with what's called Star IDAZ, uh, because they're a huge animal health uh, consortium that you're also collaborating with in, in this puzzle. Yeah, so this was one of our first formal collaborations that we established. I think it was in 2019, actually, or maybe 2020. And this was before I, I, I came to the hub. And so, yeah, this was trying to provide that stronger connection. So this is like a, a, a consortium of funders from mm -hmm, across, mm -hmm. across the globe. And this is, we wanted to provide a stronger connection with the animal health sector. So at that point, we were only focusing on human health within our dynamic dashboard. And we wanted to add further information in terms of animal health and the projects that are being funded. So this was a really um, opportune moment to do this, to be able to connect with funders uh, within the animal health area and say, you know, can you let us know what you're funding and we can put this information into our dynamic dashboard. And at the moment, we have uh, around 8% of, of the funding that goes, that we have collated within our dashboard goes to animal health. So very, very much uh, human health dominated. I must say um, my colleague Ralph Sudbrack, who's the Deputy Director at Secretariat, just come back from a meeting uh, with Star IDAS uh, in Ecuador, where they've been looking at alternatives to antimicrobials in, in animal health. So this is an ongoing collaboration and uh, Hopefully, you know, we, we provide input in terms of our expertise and they provide um, information on the projects that they're funding as well. And they're developing a, a roadmap for alternatives to antimicrobials in animal health at the moment, which is very, very exciting and very, very well uh, needed uh, at the moment. Excellent. Excellent. What, um, you know, when, when we talk about and you, you know, gave those numbers in terms of the uh, the dearth of uh, uh, anti antimicrobial development programs compared to things like uh, cancer, and of course the antimicrobial side of this is extremely important. But then, you know, you also talk, you know, a lot about uh, you know, as you were just mentioning, and you know, throughout your uh, publication history, um, all of this. Well, I say all, not. The other stuff, and when I say the other stuff, I mean uh, the bacteriophage, uh, the quorum sensing uh, compounds, the virulence factors, the stuff that may not hey kill here, but may pre you know, prevent that biofilm from forming, or for the, this cluster of microbes from doing their thing. Uh, obviously, you know, you talk about the virome, and we did a couple shows uh, last year on uh, you know, is there any way to leverage some of the good stuff, uh, not just the phage, but other good things that live in us to to fight off the bad, as, as you know. You, you worked on your early uh, work. What, what gets you excited in terms of some of these uh, these different programs, uh, these different technologies that come down the pike? And I, I, I jokingly, you know, give that scenario to, to a lot of our guests. If I was to give you a trillion dollars tomorrow, you know, what would, what would you like to work on in terms of, of some of these paths beyond just, you know, find a new antibiotics, let's say? Yeah, you know, I'm. I think I think you probably can guess. I love bacteriophage and the sort of possibilities that. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's maybe not novel, but I, I think we need to find ways that we can actually apply bacteriophage as an alternative or a complementary therapy to tackle resistant infections. You know, and I think we're getting there. I think we have a strong foundation going back hundred, you know, hundred plus years. But we're getting growing scientific evidence uh, based, you know, that the scientific evidence is growing that phage cocktails can actually address the most resistant infections. Um, I think we all know that the the current current clinical trials, the results from those have been really disappointing. Uh, but there has there's been a lot more success when you personalise those those um, applications of bacteriophage. Um, so when you use them in combination with antibiotics, you tailor them to the exact infection that a particular patient has, or you engineer them to be a bit more effective. Um, there's just been a preprint published on this by Jean-Paul Pierney at the Queen Astrid Hospital in Belgium, and they've been looking at um, the work that they've been doing within their consortium, showing the value of personalised application of phage therapy for very mm. difficult to treat infections and that's showing an amazingly promising results and I also really like the work that Martha Cloakey is doing at the Centre for Phage Research in Leicester in the UK 
because what they're doing is they're, they're taking a really systematic approach to this you know they're establishing a, a phage biobank they're looking at providing a mechanistic understanding of what the phages they have in their biobank uh, do and but very importantly they're also looking at the, the regulations and you know trying to figure out why these products are failing clinically and in terms of uh, agricultural uh, applications you know can we actually open those bottlenecks associated with regulation and commercialization of these of these new products so it's a i think that's what i'm excited about this systematic approach of you know exploiting this uh, biological entity which is everywhere and we can use it for you know, the benefit of millions of people i think this could be really really powerful if we do it right and i think these two groups are doing this in a, an amazing and uh, you know, a round of applause for them for, for taking on this, this challenge. Awesome. And, and sort of same question per the technologies, because again, you know, you've written about uh, systems biology, digital health, artificial intelligence, and silico uh, type stuff. I, I mean, these are extremely hot topics in 2023. Um, opportunities that you see for the leveraging of some of these tools um obviously we need our assays and we need to have those tanks of phage and and <laughs> and, and uh novel chemical moieties to study but uh the virtual world the in silico world what gets you excited there yeah i think there's been really interesting work with artificial intelligence i think in mit and mcmaster university they, they just published a paper on so using a machine learning to identify you know new structural structural classes of antibacterial molecules so you know this could actually lead to a new new antibacterial compounds and i think for them they were doing it uh, for a said a said a cenotobacter by mani uh, so it's one of the most dangerous uh, dangerous bacterial pathogens in terms of resistance in public health um, mm -hmm. In public health terms and so they were they were looking at this i mean what i find is really interesting they can find these new these new molecules but then you've got to go through that whole process now of making sure that you know you have the, the scientific basis there but you have to have the regulations and financial challenges along that journey from that exciting scientific uh, discovery to really an accessible product on the market. So I think if this could be translated into products, this, this is fantastic. You know, it takes away that, that laborious, that laborious sort of um, experimental phase of looking for new molecules that can actually work as antibacterial. So mm -hmm. it takes a little a little bit of the scientific challenge. Um, one other thing, Wendy, I, um, I'm sitting here on the uh, U.S. East Coast in uh, in Philadelphia, and you know we we do have a lot of biotech that goes on here, but we don't usually get the major conferences. And I was really excited to see that in a couple of weeks, uh, the World Antimicrobial Resistance Congress is going to be downtown here at the Convention Center. You're going to be speaking at it. Um, what are you going to be talking about? Um, and are there any other events that we should know about in terms of you and AMR and spreading the word on the public scene, whether it's for the rest of 2023, upcoming in 2024, anything else you want to mention in terms of uh, public facing activities on this extremely important theme, please. Yeah, no, that's great that you know about the World AMR Congress. And so we're going to be around the corner. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't realize. I'll we'll come, we'll come and visit you. Yeah, no, we're, we're going to talk about partnerships uh, along the value chain in terms of developing new antimicrobials. And we have people from CarbX, AMR Action Fund, uh, Guard P, and uh, EU Jamrai. And together, you know, they, they kind of cover the, the private public partnerships and also academia and sort of you know having a conversation together on how we can work together to actually accelerate the development of the products that we need and we're also going to be talking about alternatives to antibiotics in the in the human and animal health sector so you know this is the right place you've got all the right people together you've got you know the scientists you've got the policy makers and sort of the public private partnerships that are all there uh, working towards the same goal so it's a, it's a great time to be there we're also going to be at the European Health Forum, Gastein, in the end of September, again, talking about what policymakers can do to accelerate the progress and uh, you know, beat, you know, beat the resistance race, in a sense, you know, be able to 
uh, find policy solutions there. So a bit more away from the public-private partnerships, more to looking at what policymakers can do to actually, you know, implement mechanisms that will incentivize the development of new antibacterials or how they can further support R&D uh, with new policies there. Uh, what else are we doing? Uh, World Health Summit in Berlin in October uh, as well. And again, we'll kind of be talking about what we can do to, to help incentivize the development and accelerate the process in terms of uh, developing new, new antibacterials and also providing access to those, those new antibacterials. So that kind of takes us up to the end of 2023. Uh, 2024, yeah, a few things going on today, then, then as well. I think we're all looking forward to UNGA 2024, the high level meeting in September. Uh, we're all working towards, you know, trying to make sure that we have um, recommendations and uh, concrete actions, collective actions that we can uh, make sure that's incorporated to any, any um, communiques that come out of UNGA. 2024 meeting in September and also there's one in November in Saudi Arabia a high level meeting on AMR that we hope to you know to really have progress and concrete action that will make sure that we can have some impact in terms of mitigating the impacts of, of AMR. Outstanding. No, it's really, really outstanding and so very important uh, you know, as we discussed in 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 getting rid of the silent part of the uh, of this story uh, and, and really letting the, the globe know that uh, we have a problem here and we need new approaches and technologies. And I, I'm just very happy that you're leading leading this charge and booting you on uh, for, for much success uh, as you continue in this role, Leslie. Um, again, for everybody that is going to be listening to this particular episode of our show across the various podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel. Again, you've been spending time with Dr. Leslie Ogilvy, Director, Global Antimicrobial Resistance R&D Hub Secretariat, uh, doing really amazing things to, to combat this uh, pandemic of, of uh, AMR. Uh, Leslie, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time out of your schedule to, to come talk to us for a little while to educate us on this extremely important topic. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing there at the Hub. And as we like to say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for so many people out there uh, via what you do. A really great story. Thank you, Ira. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.